Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Uh, just so you know, everybody, um, I appreciate the great majority of comments uh, that everybody leaves, uh, but I'm starting to have some carpal tunnel tr troubles. Uh, so I'm going to have to probably lay off the keyboard for a little while. And uh, this might be, I might just cut back on uh, some audio stuff too. So I don't know. I think I got to get out of here. But uh, just so you know, Melbourne, Australia is in complete medical quarantine martial law. You know, they're not... You know, if they always do what's called a trial balloon, they try something and then see how it goes. Uh, Germany, uh, they're protesting, marching in the streets, protesting against all this draconian measures. But uh, I don't know. But you don't hear much about it. You know, you got uh, the news. All right, but uh, enough of that. Let's do uh, a Bible study. This is going to be part three of water. We're doing the New Testament. And um, just remember, Jesus said, of all those that were born of women, there was not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. So Matthew chapter three and verse one. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, that's the Greek rendering of Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment, which is clothing, and the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Can you imagine John the Baptist showing up at a Baptist church, you know, either independent or Southern Baptist? They would uh, disdain him as being a homeless bum and probably show him to the door. <laughs> so, you know, think about it. That's what Christianity so-called has become. I mean, John the Baptist would be shown the door in probably 90-something percent of all the churches. 90-something percent. I don't know the exact, you know, 95, 98, 99, 99.99999. I don't know. Verse 5, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So here it is, they were getting basically a bath, right? Um, water over the flesh. Basically, it's, you know, a ceremonial type bathing of, it's a public, ad, a public admission and confessing their sins. Now, I, uh, I've i never really been to Narcotics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous, but I've known people that did. And uh, they were telling me a lot of times when they were talking, it, it was more of a bragging session than, you know, confessing their sins. I mean, really? Oh, yeah, I used to be able to drink a fifth of, a fifth of liquor before noon. You know, I don't know. But that's what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to repent, confess our sins, and then turn away from them. And like I say, sometimes I'm a hypocrite. Um, and, you know, they were baptized. He was baptizing them in, in the river. Uh, the washing of the flesh, basically. But when he, John, saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, now the Pharisees and the Sadducees were 
two different denominations of the Jews. Uh, basically, the Pharisees were, I think they were the majority, and they believed what was called the Babylonian Talmud, the traditions of the elders. But they believed the comments of the rabbis over and above the Bible. But basically, they believed the entire, what we call the Old Testament. They believed the whole thing, to an extent. Unless a rabbi that they liked explained something away. Sort of like what the Baptist ministers do with the, uh, the rapture being before the tribulation. And then you got the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the ones that were basically doing the Levitical priesthood in the temple. Uh, their writings were Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They only acknowledged the five books of Moses. That's it. So when the Bible talked about angels or the resurrection, uh, they didn't believe the rest of the Bible. I mean, seriously, they didn't believe in angels or in the resurrection. So, but uh, that's just a little history lesson there. But when he, John, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, Oh, you wonderful people, how are you doing? No. He said, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to be our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Just remember, Esau was a child of Abraham, and God hated Esau. Judah married a Canaanite woman, and all those children could claim to be one of Abraham's kids. Think about it. Every single one of them. Ishmael, who was rejected of God, and Is Esau also. He was a direct descendant of Abraham. For I, uh, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Didn't we do studies on part two about trees? Oh yeah, we certainly did. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. People, you don't do good works or fruit to be saved. Good fruit or good works is proof that you are saved. Read James chapter 2. James is a wonderful book, especially the first two chapters. Well, those are the ones I'm most familiar with. The whole book is wonderful. James had a mother named Mary and a father named Joseph. Guess who he grew up with? Yeah. I'll give you three guesses. And it wasn't Yeshua HaMashiach. So he knew Jesus quite well, in an earthly sense. Verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. So John baptizes with water for repentance. And he says, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He, Jesus, he shall baptize you 
with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Wow. Now remember, in Peter, the book of Peter, I think it's 2 Peter, talks about the earth being burned up. All the wicked works of this world are going to be burned up. The flood of Noah, the water, washed away all the wickedness. But God promised Noah no more water flooding. So the next time, it's going to be by fire. And uh, those of us that are saved, we're going to be tried by fire. Oh, yeah. Just like, you know, and think about it. The, remember the um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew children that were thrown into the furnace of fire in Daniel's day by Nebuchadnezzar? Their, their clothes weren't burned. Not even a hair was singed. They didn't even have the smell of smoke on their body. That's going to be us. And if we have good works, they're going to remain. All the bad works are going to be burned up. Boy, I'm going to have a lot of stuff burned up. I'm telling you. You know, good works are proof of your salvation. And it's just amazing. You know, people try to do good works. And people claim you're trying to earn your salvation by being obedient and uh i don't know but it is true we're saved by grace that is the absolute truth i indeed baptize you with water under repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than i whose shoes i am not worthy to bear he shall baptize you with the holy ghost John baptized us with water for the body. The Lord is going to baptize us with the Holy Ghost in the Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. What has a fan done? It's to fan the fire, right? And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Oh, yeah. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. In other words, allow. Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. You know, I've had people tell me, Oh, the King James is Bible so hard to read. No, it's not. It's really not. I mean, granted, you know, I took a course in uh, English literature where we studied old English literature, and I'm familiar with the language. You know, that helped. That helped. I got to admit it. But the thing is, you get on your hands and knees and ask the Lord for understanding. He'll give it to you. He will most certainly give it to you if you seek, seek it with all your heart. And you're one of his. But you have to dig. You know, when you're a farmer, you can't sleep till noon and say, well, you know, I trust the Lord. He's going to he's going to give me a bumper crop this year. No. You got to get out of bed. You got to put the uh you know, plow the ground, whatever, dig dig the hole, plant the seed, and then get on your hands and knees and pray for the rain or the irrigation. You know, you can't be lazy. So that's basically what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help water the seed. Because I'm not an evangelist. Verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. 
and a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then, of course, Jesus was taken into the wilderness for 40 days. I just did a Bible study on that, if you're interested. You know, I don't know how long I'm going to be on YouTube. I've been on YouTube for a year longer than I thought I would. So, and like I say, uh, anybody want to, send me an email, Palm Beach Weddings with an S at gmail.com and because uh, I live in Palm Beach County Palm Beach Weddings at gmail.com and uh, you know I'll give you an address and send me a 64 gig drive or an SD card actually I'd prefer an SD card um, but uh, USB drive will work and uh, I'll send you everything I've got everything and you can do whatever you want with it all right let's uh let's get going here here's a good story matthew chapter 8 i'm actually going to give you two stories let's go verse 23 and when he jesus was entered into a ship his disciples followed him and behold there arose a great tempest in the sea what's the sea made out of water insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves but he was asleep and his disciples came to him and awoke him saying lord save us we perish and he said unto them why are ye so fearful o ye of little faith then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm but the men marveled saying what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Well, yeah, the answer to that is in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. God was manifest in the flesh. Real simple. Verse 28, second story. And when he was come to the other side, into the country of the uh, Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. How many people are in mental hospitals that are possessed of devils? I mean, I, you know, I wish we had Christians to go there and cast them out uh. and behold they cried out saying what have we to do with thee Jesus thou son of God art thou come hither to torment us before the time and there was a good way off from them a herd of many swine feeding uh, think about this the next time you have um, a ham sandwich or a pork shoulder roast. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer, or allow, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. Even pigs didn't even want to be possessed with devils. They would rather die than be possessed of devils. I wonder how many uh, musical stars, you know, groups, people like Jimi Hendrix, who I used to listen to a lot. I wonder how many of those are possessed by devils. And that's where they get their talent from. I mean, let's face it. These fallen angels are thousands of years old. I mean, if you spent 
I don't know, 20, 30,000 hours learning how to play guitar, I mean, how good would you be? Especially, you know, think about it. So, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. All right, and verse 33, And they that kept them, you know, the swine, and they that kept them fled and went their ways into the city and told everything, and what was uh, befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coasts. So they didn't like this little, you know, uh, oh man, this guy, he just had our whole food supply run off the side of the, 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 you know, <laughs> the cliffs into the ocean, you know. But not only that, you know, when, when you start dealing with the occult and stuff, people don't like that, you know. Instead of being happy that these uh, people have been, you know, delivered, they, they asked Jesus, hey, uh, can you get out of here? We, we're not interested in what you're, uh, whatever you have, we're not interested in. In Matthew 10, 42, Jesus said, And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only, in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Let's go to Matthew chapter 14. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. So Jesus had just given a sermon and uh, fed everybody. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. That's what I need to do. Go up into a mountain to pray alone. Just the Lord and me. Uh, verse 24, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. In other words, they were fighting against the wind, right? And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Jesus was walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So he kept his eyes on Jesus. He was walking on water. He was fine. But when he took his eyes off Jesus, oh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 30, but when he saw the winds boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Yeah, that, that's, that's a lesson here. When you take your eyes off of Jesus and you're looking at the storms of life, you're going to sink. Oh, yeah. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, therefore didst thou doubt. And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Boy, I'll tell you, what a lesson there, huh? All right, let's go to John chapter 2. Actually, this I should have started this Bible lesson with this particular instance. 
but uh, I'm following the book order. All right, John chapter 2, verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Now isn't that interesting? The uh, Personally, I believe he's referencing the Last Supper, where he told the disciples, you know, he took the wine, he says, this cup is the wine of my, you know, the new, the new testament, the new covenant. Take ye, drink all of it. Uh, the bread is my body. Take and eat. Matter of fact, let's uh, take a look at that real quick. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter twenty-six. Matthew twenty-six twenty-six. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I don't know. I kind of suspect this is what um, Christ was referring to in John chapter 2, verse 4. So she says, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Verse 5. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. If only the Catholics that love to pray to Mary would listen to the words of Mary. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Verse 6. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. And I know I've said it many times, but, you know, that's what people do. And I mean, I used to drink, not a lot, but I mean, I've been I've been stinking drunk a few times, too many. But that's the thing. You put out the good stuff first and then everybody's drunk, you put out the rot gut. And uh I've listened to Baptists and they're, you know, and they'll say, "Oh, well, Jesus didn't turn the water into wine. No, it was Welch's grape juice." You know, you don't say that. Oh, you know, everybody drinks the, the good grape juice, and then after they are drunk, you know, then you put out the garbage stuff. Then you put out the bluebird, right? No, no. And and nobody that's uh, over the age of 12 drinks grape juice at a wedding. I mean, you know, I used to perform weddings. Trust me. And quite a few of them invited me for dinner, which was very gracious of them. And I used to give them a, a wedding present. I would bring uh, my Nikon professional camera that I lost up in Arkansas, thanks to that goat. And I'd take pictures for them. And uh, I'm not a bad photographer, where I was. I don't have a camera anymore. Had a $1,000 camera. 
And a thousand dollar lens, all gone. Thank you, uh, thieving liar. And uh, and I'm supposed to forgive. That's that's the hard part, right? So this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifesting forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. The beginning of miracles was at a wedding. So the water and the wine pointed to the Last Supper, in my opinion. And maybe the beginning of miracles pointed to the marriage supper of the Lamb, where the those in Christ are resurrected in glory, called to the marriage supper. I mean, I don't know. That's kind of how I look at it. Maybe somebody's got a different idea. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. I, that's, you know, what can I tell you? All right, let's go to Book of John, Chapter 3. Very, very famous chapter in the Bible. Very famous. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Oh, I know, everybody knows this story. A ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night because I guess he didn't want uh, everybody to recognize him, right? And said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Nicodemus knew, but the Jews didn't. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Some people say, well, you got to be born from above. Well, you know, I, I don't I don't see the difference. I, you know, people argue and but I mean if you're you're born once physically and then you got to be born spiritually. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus, you're thinking on the fleshly uh, plane realm. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And there are denominations of churches that will tell you, Well, you know, that's talking about getting baptized in water. You can't be saved unless you're baptized in water. Really? Was the thief on the cross, was he baptized in water? He said, Lord, remember, remember me when thou, you know, when you go into your kingdom. Jesus said, uh, what did he say to him? This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Uh, he says, no, no, you, you're, you can't. You can't come down from the cross and get baptized, so you can't be saved, according to some churches. I mean, seriously. How can a man be born of water? Well, have you ever heard of a woman saying, oh, my water broke? Yeah. Yeah. How does the baby breathe? The baby breathes by the umbilical cord. They're in a sack of water. I think it's what, amniotic fluid? It's basically water. You know? Except a man be born of water, physically, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind. The word wind in the Greek is from the word pneuma. It's where you get the word, uh, you ever heard of pneumatic tools? 
guys probably have. You ever go to a tire shop? They're using pneumatic tools, air tools, instead of electricity. Uh, places that have water on the floor, you use air tools. Compressed air. Because it's a lot safer to use than uh, electric. Pneuma. It's the word for breath, wind, but it's also the same word for spirit. Now that's the Greek. That's only in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it's a different word, but it's along the same lines, believe it or not. Uh, when it talks about, and uh, in Genesis where it says, and God breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul, basically the same thing, spirit. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell from whence it cometh and whither it goest. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven." And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And here's the most famous, probably the most famous verse in the world for Christians. For God so loved, past tense, for God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Alright, let's go to John chapter 4. Seems like I just did this study, but we're going to cover it again. Verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now remember, jo Jacob's name was changed by the Lord to Israel. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Why is that? Jeremiah 3.8 God divorced Israel. Real simple. Now remember, Israel was split into two kingdoms after the death of Solomon. You had Israel to the north, whose capital was Samaria. 
and you had Judah to the south, that was, the capital was Jerusalem. Now Judah was never divorced by the Lord. Why? Because God made a, a promise to King David that he would always have a, a man to sit upon the throne from King David. And Christ was of David. See, God follows his own laws. We don't follow the laws, but he does. And, uh, you know, people, I'm so sick of hearing people say, oh, the laws were nailed to the cross. The only laws that were nailed to the cross were basically uh, the Levitical laws of blood sacrifice, you know. But the Jews, so-called, want to uh, redo the blood sacrifice laws. They want to rebuild a temple and start sacrificing animals. What do you want to bet that the um, animal rights people don't say a word? You know, when they slit the throat of bulls and goats and sheep or whatever. But, uh, but like I said, uh, Jesus said the two commandments, love the Lord and love thy neighbor. Uh, by this, all the law, all the law, um, the law and the prophets were fulfilled. And I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, and hopefully you got enough sense that if you live next door to a Satanist, you move. I wouldn't want to live next door to a Satanist or a Sodomite anyways. So, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Living water. And we're going to go into that. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob? You see, this woman was an Israelite. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. She says, Art thou greater than our father Jacob? which gave us the well and drank there of himself and his children and his cattle. And what did Je and it says, Jesus answered and said unto her, did he correct her and say, oh, you're not an Israelite. You're not of Jacob. No, he didn't say that. He said, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. There you go. All right, let's go to John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. You know, the Bible always says, let us go up to Jerusalem. Why? Jerusalem is built on seven hills. Just like Rome. Oh, yeah. Everybody loves to point out the seven, seven hills, seven mountains that the, uh, the beast or the uh, mystery Babylon is on. But they failed and you know they failed to tell you that Jerusalem was uh, founded on seven hills too. Oh yeah. After this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda having five porches. You want proof that the New Testament was written in Greek? Why would it say this? Which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda. 
See, if this was originally in Greek, it wouldn't need that phrase. It would just say Bethesda, and everybody that knew Hebrew would know what it meant. No, it was written in Greek, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. Yeah, there's a big push now to tell you that the New Testament was written in Hebrew, and then those anti-Semitic Greeks uh, mistranslated it into you know Greek and then mistranslated it into English. And Jesus never said those, uh, and John and Jesus never said those unkind things to the you-know-whos. Uh, verse 3. In these laid a, a great multitude of impotent folk of blind halt. Halt means, uh, in German, halt means stop. So when people are halt, that means they can't walk. Withered, waiting for the moving of the water. There's a hospital in uh, Palm Beach County called Bethesda, believe it or not. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. So an angel went down, stirred up the water. Whosoever uh, then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Oh yeah, you know instead of uh, and instead of the uh, you know who's being happy that a man was healed, they complain that oh well you did it on the Sabbath day, you're not supposed to do that on the Sabbath day. Yet they water their animals on the Sabbath day, didn't they? Oh yeah, most certainly they did. All right, let's go to John chapter 7 and verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, stood, uh, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Uh, what happened when Jesus was on the cross? And didn't a Roman soldier stick him in the side with a spear? And what came out? Blood and water. And guess what? That's what happens. When you die... Uh, the blood and the water in your uh, inside your body separates. So there's a physical application. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then there's a spiritual application. Verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit. So here it is. There, This is parallelism. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, but this spake he of the Spirit. So the living waters are representative of the Spirit. Uh, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. All right, let's go to John chapter 13. 
Uh, this is getting to be just before the crucifixion. Matter of fact, let's let's start at the beginning, I guess. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with the towel where, wherewith he was girded. And this is... You know, let's face it, feet are probably the dirtiest part of a person's body. Jesus is showing himself that he is the servant, not only to the disciples, but to those that he's dying for. But I think there's a deeper as, uh, spiritual application of this. You know, that's the physical application. I'm going to wash your feet, show you that I'm a, your servant. Because I'm going to lay down my life for your sins. I'm going to pay the price for the Father that you can't pay for your sin debt. But I think there's a spiritual application to this. If the water is indeed indicative of the Spirit, and he's washing their feet from the filth and dirt of this world, maybe it's to, you know, for them in the Spirit, their walk in the Lord. You know, he's directing where their feet go, their walk, and their walk, uh, their spiritual walk um, after the crucifixion. I don't know. What do you think? Verse 6 Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Yeah, our feet where we walk, our hands where we do things, and our head with the things we think, right? Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet. He is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said he, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord. And ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that ye should do as I have done to you. You know, people argue and say, Well, Jesus can't possibly be God, because Jesus was praying to God. So was Jesus as God praying to himself? You know, the Bible says that God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus in the flesh was praying to God the Father as an example for us. And trust me, I'm not a, um, I'm not a super prayer guy. I wish I was. I guess I need to put some more effort into that. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. You know, 
What did Jesus say that the, um, well, let's take a look. So what does Jesus say about being the greatest? Uh, well, in Matthew 18, 1, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And in then verse 4, he says, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 23, 11 says, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Christ came to be our servant to die for us. And yet he's over all of us. So think about that. All right, now we're getting close to the end. Let's go to John chapter 19. Now, Jesus had been taken prisoner. Actually, he was kidnapped by the, uh, the you-know-whos. Wasn't the Romans. They tried him, convicted him, condemned him to death, and then brought him to Pilate to carry out the sentence. And Pilate wanted nothing to do with the charade. But his hand was kind of forced. Anybody that tells you that uh, Rome was responsible are liars. And if you don't believe me, well, let's take a look. All you got to do is read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. And uh, that tells you who che killed Jesus. And it sure as... Uh, it sure as, you know, it, it wasn't Rome. And it wasn't Pilate. Pilate tried to release Jesus. But uh, the you-know-whos wanted nothing to do with that. So Jesus is up on the cross. And uh, John chapter 19, verse 32. Then the soldiers came and break the legs of the first and of the other one which was crucified with them. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Now, there's a couple things I want to point out here. Um, a Roman soldier, a soldier, knows the difference between somebody that's dead and alive. And when you put a spear into somebody's side, he's not just going to, you know, barely put a tiny little prick in their side and a couple drops of blood. No, he's going to put that spear in deep. And when blood comes out and it's separated from water, you know the person is dead. I will guarantee you this soldier had seen death many times and knew the difference between somebody alive and somebody dead. Because there's a thing commonly circulated among the you-know-whos that Jesus really didn't die on the cross. They just thought he died on the cross. Here it is. He'd gotten beaten to a pulp. He had gotten nailed to the cross, and then he got a spear stuck in his side. And they're saying, oh, well, you know, he was in the tomb. He really wasn't dead, but he was in the tomb for three days and three nights, and then he got better. And then he walks out, you know, and everybody's like, oh, he's risen from the dead. I don't think so. They call that the swoon theory. You know, and people, you know... <laughs> People fall for this stuff. I mean, really. Jesus was beaten to a pulp. He couldn't even carry his own cross. And you're going to tell me you're in the tomb for three days and three nights with no food, no water, and you miraculously get healed? No. He was dead, people. He was dead. What came out of his side when it was pierced with a spear? Blood and water. 
What does the Bible say about blood? Well, let's take a look at Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 14. For it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not eat, I'm sorry, ye shall eat the blood of no matter of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. What does Hollywood love to uh, promote? Vampires. And what do vampires do? I want to suck your blood. <laughs> Garbage. You know, basically Hollywood and Satanists do everything the Bible says not to do. And then everything the Bible says to do, they don't. That, that's it in a nutshell. Deuteronomy 12, 23. Only be sure that thou eat not the flesh, I mean, uh, that ye eat not the blood, for the blood is the life, and thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. Leviticus 17, 11. For the, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul. Compare that to John 6, 54. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. All right, so the blood represents the life, the flesh. What does the water represent? Didn't we just read uh, not too long ago that it represents the spirit, living waters? But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. Blood and water, people. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Wow. What does Paul say about water? How about Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24? Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Wow. A husbands are commanded to love their wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. What does sanctify means? It means to set something apart, something holy, right? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And what gets me is there are people that will tell you that Paul's a false apostle. Don't listen to him. Really. They're idiots. To deny Paul is to deny the entire book of Acts because that records Paul's conversion to Christ. It also uh, his interactions with the other apostles. They also have to deny Second Peter that confirms that Paul's a brother in the faith. And they also have to claim that the Holy Spirit failed, the Holy Spirit failed to warn the apostles that Paul was a wolf in sheep's clothing. As if the Holy Spirit couldn't do his job. No, people, Paul is an apostle, and those that deny Paul deny him 
that sent Paul, which was Christ. And you may as well deny Christ that was sent by the Father. So, I hear this stuff all the time. I've been in ministry for a while. I've been in ministry on and off since the 90s. So, you know, I've been, I'm not exactly a new hand. Uh, like I say, I'm an amateur. I'm, I'm not getting paid for this. You know, I don't have a church. And uh, I don't have a congregation supporting me. Although, those of you that have sent me gifts, I appreciate it very much. But I don't beg for it. Uh, you know, but my Learjet is, uh, it's getting empty. That uh, J19 jet fuel, boy, that stuff's expensive. Do you know what it's gone up to now? Well, I don't know either because, you know, I guess my Learjet's going to be up in the sky. So, uh, <laughs> uh, not of this world. So what can I tell you? Uh, yeah, I told, I, I mentioned it before. I told everybody that uh, I had somebody tell me that I had a mansion on the beach, and I asked them, could you please send me the address, because I'd like to go check it out. Oh, yeah. All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, I guess for, verse 14. Now, Hebrews, nobody knows for a certainty who wrote Hebrews. I suspect it was Paul. That's my opinion. I mean, Paul was a scholar. Let's face it. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel. And I've actually read some of Gamaliel's uh, writings. I was actually impressed um, with Gamaliel. According to some, he became a Christian. I'm sure Paul, I'm sure Paul talked to his uh, mentor. And you know what I find interesting? You know, we're talking about water. What was Peter? A fisherman, right? A fisherman. He, he tried to catch fish in the water. You know, think about it. In Matthew 4.18, uh, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Oh, yeah. So, let's go check out Hebrews. You know, fishermen are not... You know, the only person, that, the only apostle that was probably qualified, that understood the Old Covenant best, was Paul. And if you want to believe, you know, anybody could have written it. I mean, uh, anybody under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit could have written Hebrews. But Paul, as far as I know, he was, he was schooled. He knew what the Jews believed. He knew what the Christians believed. And he knew what Christ believed. And if I remember correctly, he went into the desert for, I think, three or, f three or four years into the wilderness to be taught of Christ. But that's if you believe the book of Acts. I do. All right, Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And what are they talking about? The sacrifice of Christ, right? Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us that after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their mind, will I write them, and their sins and iniquity will I remember no more. Read Jeremiah 31, 31, the New, the new Testament, the New Covenant. Uh, but I believe, I can't remember what book this is in. This is a direct quote from an Old Testament minor prophet book, I'm pretty sure. I think it's Joel. Let me see. Okay, it is Jeremiah 31, 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with them, with the house of Israel, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Oh, yeah. 
Hebrews 10:16 This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days saith the Lord I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more Sorry the Lord's not getting Alzheimer's he's just uh you know our sins are washed away in the blood of Christ they won't be remembered Boy, I'll tell you what, my list of sins would be uh, pretty long. Now, where remission of this is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now remember when he died, the veil of the temple was rent, the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest once a year could go into the Holy of Holies and then only with blood. Matter of fact, they used to tie a rope around the ankle of the high priest because if the if God if he did something wrong and God didn't like it, he'd strike him dead. And nobody could go into the Holy of Holies, or they would have been struck dead. So if he was struck dead, um, they would pull him out by the rope uh, attached to his ankle. At least that's a, um, a Jewish legend, right? By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. Well, that's Christ. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hmm. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and do good works not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Boy, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to read it, but you should consider continue reading this chapter by yourself. It is scary. It is scary. Now in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah when the ark was a prayer a pro, was a preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. Do you know that? Noah's family was saved by water. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Now, Second uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 12. We're going to read a little bit of this. You know, there's people that will tell you that Second Peter doesn't belong in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, people that knew Peter knew that this book belonged in the Bible, but modern-day people don't like Second Peter because he confirms that Paul is a brother in the faith. Let's read Second Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Speaking about the unbelievers. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings, while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart, they have exercised with covetous practices cursed children which have forsaken the right way and have gone astray following 
the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now, Balaam was an actual prophet of God, but they bribed him with a whole bunch of riches and he fell for it. But was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water. Wells without water. People without the spirit, right? Clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity. What is vanity? Something that's worthless. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought into bondage. What bondage? The bondage of sin and death. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Wow. Uh, that's This is along the same lines as what we were reading that I didn't read to you in Hebrews. I'm afraid to read that stuff in Hebrews. What Where I left off, if you continue reading that chapter, that's scary, people. That's scary. You'll never hear Joel Osteen teaching that stuff. No. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than, after they had known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Uh, we, my dad uh, and I, we own some dogs. And it's true, dog throws up. Five minutes later, he'll go back and eat it right up. And the sow, the pig, you can baptize a pig, but it'll go right back to the mud hole. Uh, and you know what they do in the mud hole? Number two. They do number one and number two in that mud hole, and they will wallow around in that number one and number two with all the mud. You can take a, a pig, you can baptize it, wash it, and it goes right back to the mud hole of this world. There's a reason why the Lord said not to cast your pearls before swine. This is going to be a slightly longer, I, I don't want to make a part four. I want to just finish this up because I'm really, I'm getting close to the end. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Remember, Jesus said, somebody asked Jesus, what was the great commandment? He says, Thou shalt love the Lord uh, with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You know, he didn't say, Believe on the flat earth. He didn't say, Keep the Sabbath. He didn't say, Don't eat pork, although I think it's a good idea not to eat it. Uh, he said, love the Lord and love thy neighbor. And if you're led of the Spirit, the Bible says if you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandment. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Love the Lord and love thy neighbor? Is that grievous? No! No! For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory, 
And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there, oh, hold on a second. When you get a fake Bible, a fake Bible version, this will not be, what I'm getting ready to read to you will not be in it, or they'll change it. They will change this. Let me tell you, these fake book Bibles get rid of the blood. That's one thing. They get rid of the blood. They don't want you to know the life is in the blood. That Jesus shed his blood. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and Jesus Christ is the Word of God. And if i got to go to Revelation to prove that, you need to study the Bible, okay? I mean, you should know that Jesus is the Word. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And people hate, people like the Jehovah's Witnesses hate this. The oneness so-called Pentecostals hate this. You know, God made man in his image. Man has a body. Man has a soul. Man has a spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. And they're not the same. Why can't God have a body, soul, and spirit? Christ, when he was on earth, had a body. I guess God the Father translates into the soul. And then... The Holy Spirit is, well, the Holy Ghost is the Holy Spirit, right? For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Man has a body, a spirit, and a soul, and you're only one person. Three parts makes up one person. You know, just like a car. A car has one engine, one transmission, usually, unless you've got a four-wheel drive. It's got four tires, five if you count the spare, you know, it's not, you know, and then people will say, oh, well, yeah, the three parts, the Trinity, it's a false doctrine. Yeah, well, if you don't like the word Trinity, no problem, but the word Godhead is a biblical word, and Christ is God in the flesh, part of the Godhead. In him was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And Colossians 2.9, For in him, Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. How could Christ do the miracles he did? How could he raise people from the dead? How could he forgive people their sins? How could he do that? If he wasn't God in the flesh, how? You want to see a, whole, a Jehovah's Witness squirm? Ask him. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth. Three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Those two verses are no, they always change that in the new perverted Bibles. Verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God that which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. 
He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the, the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Amen, Bob says. All right, let's go read Revelation chapter 7 and verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living, living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. All right, we're almost at the end. Oh, and after I do that, I got some sayings I want to read. Uh, Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. All right, I, it's I kind of feel like a cheating, you know. It's like you uh, you buy a book and you go to the la you know, last chapter. Well, that's what you know. Revelation's the last book in the Bible, and chapter twenty-two is the last chapter of the book. So that's the end. Chap Revelation chapter twenty-two, verse one, and he showed me a pure river of water of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. What do you want? The tree of life, or you want the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? I'll pass on that one. And on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bear twelve manner of fruits. Twelve tribes of Israel, twelve manner of fruits, twelve months in a year. And yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. What nations? The nations of Israel, right? And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. I think I'd rather have the name of God in my forehead than the mark of the beast, but hey, that's just me. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had 
heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then said he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and saucers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root of and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. People, let me tell you something. Jesus says, I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright morning star. In Isaiah 14, in the modern Bible versions, including the complete you-know-who-ish Bible, a so-called messianic Bible, they take the word Lucifer, delete it, and insert the word Morning Star. So basically, they say that uh, they turn Lucifer into the Morning Star that fell from heaven and is going down into the pit of hell to be covered with worms and maggots. And yet, in Revelation 22:16, Jesus says he's the Morning Star. The NIV and the CJB, the complete you know who -ish Bible, um, it starts, the word starts with a J and rhymes with news, the complete news Bible, and the NIV both do this. And there's people like James White who defend this. Why, it's perfectly acceptable to delete the word Lucifer. It's a Latin word. It doesn't belong in the English Bible. I guess the word taco doesn't belong in the Bible, I mean, uh, in the English language either, since it's not an English word, right? Uh, but So it's okay to delete the word Lucifer and insert the word Morning Star, which is a name for Jesus? Jesus fell from heaven? The Morning Star? and is going down to the pit of hell to be covered with worms and maggots? And they call this scholarship, people. Stick with the King James. Oh, but that NIV, it's so much easier to read. Yeah, 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 Morningstar is so much easier to read than more, uh, Lucifer. But if you want to believe Jesus the Morningstar is Lucifer, A, go for it. Uh, and then they'll argue, well, you know, uh, uh, Lucifer is a Latin word. It doesn't belong in the Bible. Well, you know what? If you ask a Luciferian or a Satanist who Lucifer is, they know. It's just devils like James White that, uh, well, never mind. Verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of, this, of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these words, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man will take away of the word from the words of of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He that testify this thing saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. All right. Let's read some stuff. Righteousness exalteth a nation. Hmm. Pray hardest when it is hard to pray. Do not pray for an easy life. Pray to become strong. Oh boy, this is a good one. God has a perfect plan for our lives, but he cannot move us to the next step of his plan until we joyfully accept our present situation as part of that plan. Oh boy. All right, well, this is the conclusion, part three of Water. Um, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to them and them alone. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. <laughs>